Okay, me too, <laughs> me too. All right, so we are gonna finish up today our discussion about soft robotics and move on to creating robots from living tissue. Uh, before we do, just to pivot back to the final project for a moment, hopefully you are well on your way to performing an A-B test, collecting enough data from variant A and enough data from variant B to try and convince us next week that A is better than B, B is better than, than A, although, or there is no appreciable difference between the two. We're looking for videos, we're looking for visualizations, we're looking for an argument to convince us one way or the other. Any questions about A-B testing? Okay, we will talk on Thursday morning again just to run through exactly the logistics of what's gonna happen next Tuesday morning so that we're all on the same page and everything will run smoothly and you'll get an opportunity to see 60 different robots that perform their various tasks better or worse. Okay. We will be here next Tuesday. It's bright and early, 7.30 in the morning. I don't make the rules. We'll be here uh, and we will finish uh, on time at 10.15 a.m. And that will finish up uh, your, uh, your work for this course. I will then spend the next two days grading all the materials. And you should have your final grade for this course by next Thursday. Sound good? Okay. All right, so back to the material. Uh, we're looking at evolutionary algorithms and evolutionary robotics, where instead of what it usually occurs in uh, AI research, we are not learning just a controller for a robot. In this case, we are gradually broadening the evolutionary algorithm so that it can modify as many aspects of the robot or physical technology that can be changed, right? We looked at Carl Sims uh, last week went all the way back to the early 90s, where in silico, uh, Sims was evolving bodies and brains of robots. When we get to soft robots, a lot more opportunities present themselves for which aspects of the robot's body can be modified. In order to do so, we're going to do what we've seen many times uh, before now. We're going to evolve robots in silico and then transfer them to reality. We talked last time about uh, VoxCAD, uh, a voxel-based soft robot simulator that simulates a robot made up of a large number of finite elements. If you've ever taken an engineering class, this is known as finite element methods. In this case, and everything we're gonna see for the rest of this course, the finite element are these small 3D pixels or voxels. Inside this physics engine, these neighboring voxels are attached together by beams, which are uh, a step beyond springs. Beams resist pushing and pulling, twisting and shearing. We can set the various parameters of each of these beams to make some parts of the material stiffer, some parts of the material softer. So uh, this is some, collaborate, some collaborative work that my group did together with a mechanical engineering group at Yale. Uh, at Yale, they work with these uh, soft, hollow uh, voxels that are made from dragon skin, a particular type of rubber or silicone, which you can see at work here. And again, I forgot to bring in one of the voxels, which is in my office on the other side of this wall. I promise, I promise, I will bring it on Thursday. Okay, you can see here, this is just some preliminary work. We're literally exercising the robot here. Uh, there is a very small uh, hollow cable you can see over here, and someone is simply just pushing air with a syringe, a plastic syringe, into the voxel, and then pulling that air back out again and we are slightly deforming these voxels. So this is preparatory, preparatory work to try and cross the sim to real gap with soft robotics. This is something we're still currently working on. Some soft robots we can transfer from sim to real, some not, this is a work in progress. We started this course in the 1600s and we've pretty much caught up now to the present day, yeah? I think we ended, I landed last time by showing you the short tutorial video. So uh, if you've got 200 bucks lying around, you can get on Amazon and buy all the materials you need to create the robot you just see, saw out of uh, commercially available uh, materials that you can get right off of Amazon. So again, if you don't have anything good to do over the summer, make yourself some voxel bots. Okay, assuming we can Assuming we can cross the sim to real gap, what might we want to do? Well, we're gonna proceed again as before where 
We are not gonna presuppose the body plan of a robot. We're gonna allow the evolutionary algorithm, like Sims, to modify both the bodies and brains of our, our robots in our evolving population. Here's some uh, initial work using this soft-bodied simulator. Uh, you'll notice uh, Professor Cheney was a student at the time and worked on this project. Nick took this class several years ago and continued on uh, at, uh, at Cornell working on this soft robotics uh, project. So what you're looking at are two different simulated phenotypes. Remember a phenotype in biology is the physiology plus the behavior of an organism. It's what the organism looks like and what it does. In our case, the phenotype is usually the geometry of the robot, how many parts it's made up of, and the controller of that robot as well, and then what that simulated robot does with that controller. That's our phenotype. I'm not showing you the genotype. How might you encode a genotype for these types of robots? You can sort of see what changes are possible in this setup. This is the phenotype. How might you encode this into a genotype? We saw pretty complicated genotype to phenotype mapping last week when we, when we looked at Sims. He used, a, he used a graph to encode parts of the robot body and parts of the robot brain and then translated that uh, into a robot. You're using a genotype which is simply a vector of numbers which you use to label the weights of the synapses in your controller. Most of you are not modifying the body or you're not allowing the evolutionary algorithm to modify the body. Given all you've seen in this course so far, what might be a good genotype for this? What is, it, what is it that the evolutionary algorithm is modifying in this case? Some things are more obvious than others. It's modifying the spring, the spring variables. It's, it's modifying not the spring variables, but the beam parameters, right? So, uh, it's a little difficult to see here, but you might be able to notice that the red, the patches of red voxels are a little bit stiffer than the green, uh, than the green voxels. So the color here is representing something about the material properties of these voxels, which is really the material properties of beams that connect neighboring voxels together. Obviously, the evolutionary algorithm is also modifying the geometry, where to place voxels and where not to place voxels. How might you encode this in a genotype? So we could do something close to what you're doing in your final project. So instead of a one-dimensional vector of numbers, imagine we create a three-dimensional uh, matrix. We could store in the elements of that 3D matrix, we could store numbers that represent whether or not to place a voxel at that position. Maybe an integer of zero means don't place a voxel in this position. Other non-zero values might represent uh, to place a voxel in that position and to represent material properties of that voxel. Imagine we came up with that genotype. So we've got a 3D matrix of integers that represent whether or not to place a voxel and whether it should be stiff, stiff or soft. We create an initial population of random 3D, uh, random 3D matrices. What do you think the phenotypes would look like? If we had those random genotypes, randomly generated 3D matrices, what do you think those robots would tend to look like? They'd be, like really disconnected. They'd be really disconnected, right? It would be uh, a cloud of pixel, a cloud of voxels not necessarily connected together. So finding robots that look like this, contiguous or, or continuously connected groups of voxels, those are going to be very rare in the space of all possible genotypes if we define the genotype as a 3D matrix and we're just randomly putting integers into those elements. With enough effort, the evolutionary algorithm might be able to find some of those needles in the haystack, might be able to find some of those robots in the vast set, which are just clouds of voxels. Not very satisfying. Could we do a little bit better? What other genotypes have we seen in this course that bias evolution, they kind of focus evolution's uh, 
efforts on subsets of the space of all possible robots. And it, those genotypes tend to bias it towards not random collections of voxels, but connected sets of voxels, voxels that have symmetry, repetition. Anybody remember? Where did we see that before? Remember our discussion about uh, uh, CPPNs? Compositional pattern producing networks. We saw this when we talked about NEAT and HyperNEAT. A CPPN, the N stands for network, and like all of the neural networks we've seen so far, we've got a bunch of neurons represented as uh, nodes, and edges represent connections between the nodes. We have an input layer and we have an output layer. And remember, we did some examples at the board where we had a CPPN, we created a random CPPN, like the one that you saw here. And as we then visited various locations inside a two-dimensional uh, space on the board, it painted colors inside that uh, two-dimensional space. Right? When we talked about CPPNs, we saw how even when you create a random CPPN, it tends to produce non-random patterns. We saw even a random CPPN painting a gradient of gray from left to right. We then modified that CPPN, so now it painted a gradient of gray from bottom to top, and so on. When we did it at the board, we had two input neurons, just X and Y. We input to the input layer of the CPPN the particular position we were interested in, and then we queried the single output neuron which would dictate how much gray or how much black to put at that position, right? That's the compositional pattern producing part of a CPPN. It composes coordinate transforms so that we're visiting various positions and painting regular patterns across that space. We got from painting regular patterns in 2D to 3D by adding a third input neuron to our CPPN. And now we were visiting individual positions inside a three-dimensional volume and painting colors or painting something inside that 3D volume. When we talked about CPPNs uh, about a month ago, we saw an application where they took CPPNs and painted weights onto synapses inside a robot's neural controller where that neural controller sat in three-dimensional space. It had a geometry to it, right? So uh, in this case, Nick and his colleagues adapted CPPNs to paint colors inside a three-dimensional space, like we saw before. So there was one, uh, in this case, there are actually two output neurons. One output neuron, whatever value arrived at that output neuron, for each position in this three-dimensional space, they squashed that value to a binary value. If that value at a particular position was zero, no voxel was placed at that position. If at another position, when they plugged in the coordinates of that position and a one arrived at that output neuron, they would place a voxel at that position. So that first output neuron is building the geometry, building the body of the robot. The second output neuron was clamped to an integer between one, two, three, or four. Remember that we can place different kinds of activation functions inside a neuron so that the raw weighted sum arriving at the neuron, we can push that through different kinds of activation functions, which will send out different kinds of values. In the case of the first output neuron, we're clamping it to a value between zero and two. In the second output neuron, we're clamping it to an integer one, two, three, or four, where those two, those four integer values represent the color we're going to paint onto that voxel. Red, green, light blue, and the fourth option is dark blue, which you can't see in this example, but you'll see in a video in a moment. So we have four input neurons and two output neurons. We have X, Y, and Z. The fourth one that's added here, D, this is the distance that that particular position inside this uh, cage is from the center of the cage. They don't strictly need D. We could have just fed in the X, Y, and Z position inside this cage. 
What do you think adding this fourth input neuron does? Every time we visit a position inside this 3D space to determine whether or not to place a voxel at that position and which color to paint that voxel, what influence do you think it has that we're including D? The distance from the center of the cage. This is a relatively complicated CPPN here. Imagine we had a much simpler CPPN. Imagine we had a much simpler CPPN that takes just D as input, and we'll just use the first of the two output neurons here, the presence or not of a voxel. Imagine we set the weight of this individual synapse between this single input neuron and this single output neuron to some value so that if D is above some threshold, we will place a voxel. And if D is below some threshold, we will not place, uh, sorry, if D is below a threshold, we will place a voxel. If D is above some threshold value, we're not gonna place a voxel. Let's try and paint, not in, two, in 3D, but in 2D. We start at this position here. This is quite far from the center of this two-dimensional space. So we don't place a voxel there. Next position is still pretty far from D. We're not gonna place a voxel there. We're still pretty far from D, still pretty far from D. Now imagine we query this position inside this two-dimensional space and this position is less than whatever this threshold is to D, and we place a pixel at that position. If I continue this thought experiment with this hypothetical CPPN that is gonna drop pixels if a candidate position is close enough to the center, the distance from the center is below this threshold, what is the phenotype gonna look like? What pattern is this CPPN going to paint? Absolutely, right? So you're going to get a circle of voxels. Why do you think they included D? Remember that the way we set up the CPPN sort of biases where the evolutionary algorithm hangs out in the space of all possible voxel bots. There's a lot of preference of not having like really long possible. So it's biasing it towards certain kinds of shapes or certain kinds of designs. Remember, this is what CPPNs do. It biases evolution towards symmetry, repetition. It tends to also bias towards contiguous things, connected pieces, right? We don't have a random cloud of pixels in this example. So we get contiguity, we get repetition, and we get symmetry. Including D biases evolution towards a particular kind of symmetry. What kind of symmetry is it? We spent quite a bit of time in this course, especially when we talked about the biomechanics of locomotion. Spent a lot of time talking about bilateral symmetry, right? There's another very popular form of symmetry in nature that we haven't talked about so much. Radial symmetry, right? Maybe that's useful, maybe it's not. By throwing in D here, they give evolution the option of sampling from the space of radially symmetric uh, shapes. Yeah? Okay. Any questions about the genotype here? So when we talked about sims last time, we saw a particular genotype to phenotype mapping. They, uh, the genotype was a graph that produced a bunch of connected rigid obje objects. Here we have a different genotype to phenotype mapping. Again, we have a graph here. It's a particular type of graph or network, a CPPN, and it's producing a particular type of phenotype, which is uh, a, combination, uh, a combination of blocks. These blocks have different colors. If we now take this phenotype, the shape with these colors, and drop it into the physics engine, we can use the colors to tell the physics engine what material properties those voxels should have. Okay, here is this evolutionary, particular evolutionary algorithm 
in action. You'll notice in a moment they're going to flash up the four different types of voxels. You'll notice the red and green increase and decrease in volume, their muscle. And the light blue is going to be, is going to be simulated as quote unquote tissue. This is going to be soft support. So light blue voxels are going to be made up of beams that are very, very soft. You can think of these as rubber beams. They can be relatively easily pushed and pulled by neighboring voxels. They can be uh, twisted. They can be sheared. The red and green voxels, they, rep they represent this video as quote unquote muscle. And as you saw, these will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume. What do you think we're telling the physics engine in order to make these voxels that spontaneously increase and decrease in volume? What are we telling the beams to make that happen? Remember our discussion about springs and beams? Yep. Absolutely, the resting length. So we're going to, or the physics engine is going to dynamically change the resting length of the beam so that it will, the beam itself will elongate or shorten or twist or shear. It doesn't seem to make much physical sense. It's hard to think of a steel beam or a rubber beam that is spontaneously increasing or decreasing in length. Imagine that we cut the beam in half and we put a linear motor, a piston, into that beam, which is pulling or pushing on the two halves of the beam. It's a little bit closer if we wanted to actually build these beams in reality. The fourth and final type, the fourth and final type of voxel we're going to look at here is a dark blue voxel, which they refer to as quote unquote bone. This is passive uh, hard support. So these are stiff voxels that resist being pushed or pulled uh, or twisted or sheared by their neighboring voxels. Blue voxels are going to have six steel beams coming out of them, right? They're resisting any deformations. So far, so good? Okay. Last detail, have a look at the red and green voxels again. You'll notice both of them are increasing and decreasing in volume, but they're increasing and decreasing in antiphase to one another. We've seen that idea several times in the course now. This is a, a biological detail that's being incorporated into this experiment. What biological detail is this? We've got groups of muscles where when one group expands, the other contracts and vice versa. Close. It's the pair of terms we used for this before. Our bodies are made up of pairs of muscles that relax when one of them pulls and relaxes when the other one pulls. What are these pair of muscle groups called? They exist all through your body. Antagonist. Yep, antagonistic and agonist. Agonist, antagonistic groups. Yeah, we've seen this before. So here's the soft robot equivalent. By allowing the CPPN to place different red and green uh, groups of voxels, those red and green groups can pull and push in antiphase to one another. And as I continue this video, you're going to see that evolu this evolutionary algorithm makes good use of this idea. Okay. You're going to see some snapshots of evolved robots. Everything else about this evolutionary algorithm is exactly like what you've seen before. Dark blue is bone, passive stiff material. Light blue is like fat, it's passive soft material. And you can see the red and green groups moving in antiphase with one another. When this was published back in 2013, somebody dubbed these the Jello bots. Seems, make, seems to make sense. Would the collisions that exist here also treat it as kind of soft? Uh, yes, absolutely. When co collisions are detected and resolved in this physics engine, those collisions are also detected and resolved in a soft manner. Yep. Okay. So here's one evolutionary run. Here's a fitness curve, and they're playing back the best robot in the population at that evolutionary time. You'll notice something has already started to occur here. Tell me something about 
Tell me about the particular, the general solution that evolution seems to have already hit on. A ton of muscle, right? Very little blue voxels. Why? Absolutely, right? Remember our discussion about locomotion? It's always a trade-off between displacement, how fast you move, energy efficiency, how much energy you use to do so, uh, robustness, how many different environments can you move about in, and the fourth one was stability, right? Do you fall over or not while moving? If we're only selecting for forward locomotion, and evolution, in essence, can add or remove motors by adding or removing red and green voxels, the obvious solution is to just become a ball of muscle. Yeah? So you can see that evolution, in this case, has struck a very extreme trade-off between displacement and energy efficiency. This is not, these are not very energy efficient robots. So geometry matters, absolutely, right? So a cube is not a good solution here. You get the beginnings of legged locomotion. You can almost start to recognize some gates, almost some quadrupedal gates. Okay. We'll just play some other evolved robots from other evolutionary runs. A little bit of bone and fat in this case, whether it's useful or not, hard to say. What do you think the chances are of transferring these from sim to real? You think these are gonna cross the reality gap? Probably not. Questions before we move on? I can't tell what this is. Do you want the green ones with the same default size? Uh, the same default size. All of the voxels have exactly the same volume. They all have the same length, width, and height. But their volume changes over time, which is another difference between soft robots and rigid robots. Rigid robots have a constant volume, right? They don't increase and decrease in size. When we're simulating the soft robots, we are assuming that the voxels can increase and decrease in size. How that would be realized in reality is left unspecified in the simulation. Here's an example of how you could create a physical version of some of these robots where the volume is increase, the volumes of the voxels are increasing and decreasing. Uh, soft robotics is a relatively new branch of the study of robotics in general. Most of the researchers working in the field of soft robotics, some of them are roboticists, some of them are material scientists and chemists. There's a lot of interesting work on creating new kinds of materials that can increase and decrease their volume. They can spontaneously stiffen and soften when they're heated or cooled. There's a lot of interesting work thinking about how to actually create the next generation of robots that can change their geometry, can change their volume, can change their material properties. Yeah. So how we might go about try, trying, assuming we even could cross the reality gap with some of these, how we would actually go about building them in reality, there is a growing number of options about how we might do so. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, all right, so we can evolve these robots in simulation. Let's go back to the question of why. Why would we want to create soft robots? From an engineering perspective, uh, maybe we want to create robots that can deform their body or ooze into very small apertures, perform inspection tasks, get into areas that would be very difficult for humans to reach. It's a good reason to study soft robotics. 
There are other reasons, which is we might be able to make them more adaptive and ultimately more intelligent. So coming back to the scientific side of, of robots, where we're interested in building robots as models of cognition, intelligence as it could be. Remember uh, our discussion about the evil starfish. When we cut off the leg of the evil starfish, the evil starfish had only one option available, which is to update its controller, to update its brain, the way it organizes motion, to come up with a new way of walking, to compensate for its injury. Right? That's its way to adapt, to recover from surprise. When we get to soft robots, other options become possible. If a soft quadrupedal robot like the one up here suffers various kinds of injuries and insults, what are the options available to it? How might it go about recovering from that injury? It could adapt the synaptic weights in its neural controller to move in a new way, given its new body plan, but there are other possibilities. What are they? New way of what? Retract, contracting like certain muscles that might be able to be rebalanced, at least like weight-wise, to experience the stroke? Absolutely, right? So if you are very soft, you can deform your body, not just your controller, in order to recover from surprise. We've talked in this course about the difficulties of defining intelligence. An easier way to sneak up on creating intelligent machines is to build various components or building blocks of intelligence into those machines, one building block at a time. One important building block that we've mentioned a few times now is recovering from situations that are surprising. Yeah? So if you're a soft robot, in theory, you might be more, quote unquote, intelligent than a rigid robot because you, you have more options available to you in recovering and overcoming surprising challenges uh, in your life. In the case of a soft robot, you can literally deform your shape to recover from injury. So in this more recent experiment, again, we conducted with our Yale colleagues, we asked the following question. If we damage, if we train a simulated quadruped to walk, and then like in the evil starfish experiment, we chop off various legs, what will the evolutionary algorithm do? Will it come up with changes to the robot's body to recover from injury? Will it come up with changes to the, will it leave the body alone and alter the controller instead? Will it alter both? Let's see. Here's, here's the robot cut in half, and here's the controller trying to recover. Not very good. It's able to move a little bit. That's the best, that's the best a quadru the soft quadruped can do if we cut it in half. Now, cutting it in half is a pretty serious insult. Can we do better? So in this, in this video here, this is, from, uh, this is from, let's see, this particular experiment here where we ran the evolutionary algorithm and it was only allowed to change the controller inside the remainder of the body. Here's an example from a different experiment where in this case we cut off all four legs. Here's the original undamaged quadruped. So we trained a controller for this quadruped like we've seen many times before. And once it's evolved this ability to walk, we're going to cut off these four legs. And it comes up with what was suggested uh, a couple minutes ago, which is deform the voxels to recover or regenerate lost limbs. And this particular robot is running with the pre-damaged controller. It's altered the shape of its body, and it just continues on without having to update, uh, update its controller. So already we see that this soft robot is exploiting, is able to exploit some of the options available to it that were not available, are not available to rigid robots. Yes, question. So did you train the bodies with the regular body plan and then you altered the body and then you did it with what the intelligence and the altered body you did? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So before we do any of these injuries, like, like in the evil starfish experiment, in the first phase of the experiment, we just train a controller for these robots, allowing the evolution to tailor the synaptic weights 
of the neural controller for these soft robots, exactly like you're doing in your final project. In phase two, we then alter the robot's body in these surprising ways. Like the evil starfish, all of these soft robots, they don't have a camera, they don't have pain receptors, they can't see, they can't directly sense that something has changed. All evolution does is try and alter what remains to maximize forward displacement. Yeah? Okay, so these first two videos were not that surprising to us. If you don't allow the robot to change shape and it has to alter, it has to adapt its controller to compensate from the injury, okay, maybe this is the best you can do. If you can alter your body, regenerating or regrowing lost limbs makes sense. As always, thinking about thinking is misleading. I'm gonna show you a second evolutionary run with, I'm sorry, this should, it should actually be this one here. If you lose, if you lose two legs, you could possibly regenerate or regrow the lost ones or retract the intact ones and revert back from legged locomotion to something halfway between peristalsis. Remember how earthworms crawl through soil or how your throat muscles swallow food? Something between peristaltic motion and legged locomotion. This robot is running again the pre-damaged controller. It hasn't altered its brain, it's just altered evolution, has altered the volumes of these voxels to allow the pre-injured controller to produce locomotion. Thinking about thinking is misleading. This we did not see coming. So you're not evolving the controller in this case, you're evolving the size of the robot. You're evolving, yeah, exactly. So evolution is able to set the default volume of each of the voxels. It's setting the default rest length of the beams between neighboring voxels, yeah? So in this experiment, whenever we injure the robot, we can give it various options. We can allow it to tune the volumes of the voxels, change the body. We can allow it to tune synaptic weights, adapt your controller to recover from injury, or we can allow it to do both. Okay, uh, in recent work, uh, another former student in, uh, who took this course, Sam Kriegman, uh, with some other students, took the VoxCAD simulator, which originally ran on CPUs, and adapted it to run on GPUs, um, which allowed us to simulate much, much more voxels than we normally could. So if you can now make a robot out of not 10 or 20 or 30 voxels, but thousands of voxels, what might you want to do with it? Our first attempt to exercise this new physics engine, which we call VoxCraft, to distinguish it from VoxCAD, which ran, ran on uh, CPUs, is make fractal robots. So what's a fractal? A fractal is something that has self-similar structure. You take a particular shape, and you put, that, you put copies of that shape together to produce a larger version of that shape that self-similar structure. Here you can see us rendering this self-similar structure in the VoxCraft simulator. This is obviously not moving yet. This is just fractals, self-similar structure. If we go from fractals to fractal robots, you can ask the following question. If you make a robot that has self-similar structure, Shapes, copies of shapes are put together to produce the same shape. Does a robot composed of self-similar structure produce self-similar function? What do you mean by self-similar function? Great question. What do we mean by self-similar function? Here's an example. On the left, you're going to see a very <laughs> physically unrealistic robot that's evolved to move from left to right as fast as possible. So the left side of this video is exactly like what we've seen before. We then go one step further, take that particular shape and put that shape, copies of that shape together to produce another robot that has self-similar structure. 
all of the units in here are acting in the same way that this one does, but because they're connected together, the motion is not the same. We can then ask, does this robot produce the same function or the same behavior as its components do? That's self-similar function. Is this particular fractal robot exhibiting self-similar function? No, right? So this was already a surprising result. This, is, this was actually a research question. If you build a robot with self-similar structure, does it produce self-similar function? And the answer is no. However, if you create an evolutionary algorithm and you create a fitness function that selects for self-similar function, you can get it. Here's an evolved shape on the left that evolution discovered. That's a little slow, let me speed it up a bit. Uh, sorry, I, I anticipated myself here. Here's one, another one that also doesn't produce self-similar function. This one actually produces much more motion at the larger scale and relatively little at the base scale. It's the opposite of the one we just saw. This, this fractal robot, sorry, this fractal robot produces what we want, displacement at the base unit, but when we put it together, we don't get it. So there's different kinds of, uh, there's different kinds of failure to produce self-similar function. Sometimes the units move, but the uh, full robot doesn't. Sometimes the units don't move and the full robot does, which started to suggest to us somewhere in the space of all possible fractal robots, there are fractal robots that will move at both scales. Here's an example of a robot that has self-similar structure, self-similar function. Not perfect, you can see the, the kind of motion is a little bit different, but it is possible. What do you think the fitness function was that we used here to search among the space of all possible fractal robots for those that produce self-similar function? What would be a fitness function that selects for self-similar function or self-similar behavior? Absolutely, right? So like we've seen a million times before, we measure the displacement of both of these robots, multiply those values together. So if you fail to move at one scale, you get low fitness as a whole. If you get non-zero displacement in the base case and the fractal case, now you're getting somewhere. Now you're starting to evolve self-similar function. That just says that they are both doing well, not doing the same thing. That, that they're both doing well, that's true. So they could possibly move in different ways. And if you'll notice, this one isn't quite move, doesn't quite move in the same way at both scales. So self-similar function is not a yes or no, a yes or no feature, right? We might be able to come up with a more intelligent fitness function that says, don't just produce displacement at both scales, but move in the same way. We could start to add some terms that would penalize for differences between the type of motion at these two different scales. Yeah? Importantly, in this experiment, we were evolving self-similar function, but evolution was not free to play with self-similar structure. Self-similar structure was imposed. Evolution could play with structure. It could make the building blocks, it could make the geometry and the material distribution in the building blocks, but whatever shape it came up with, we forced the simulator to put that shape together in a self-similar manner. Yeah. Turns out that you can keep going at least up to one more size scale. This pretty much maxed out the GPU supercomputer that's over in South, uh, South Burlington. Couldn't go any further than this. 
More or less self-similar function at the two lower scales, not so much at the, the top scale. A little, a little bit. Okay. So this was just sort of an exercise for this new GPU version to see what we could do if we simulated robots made of smaller and smaller and more and more finite elements, which in this case were voxels. Okay, any questions about that? As I mentioned, soft robotics is sort of a brand new branch of robotics. This is still work in progress. We've kind of crossed the sim to real gap in a few cases, still exercising the physics engine in this case. Any other questions before we move on? Yes? Are there any ways that you can predict the position to get more efficient and like handling and treatment the boxes? Yeah, great, great question. So there's a lot of interesting computer science questions you can ask here about trying to make the physics engine itself uh, more efficient. If you were going to tackle that, that question, making this particular physics engine more efficient, which aspect of the physics engine would you tackle first? What's the slowest part of updating a simulator from one time step to the next? It's true in PyBullet, it's true in VoxCAD, it's true in VoxCraft, it's true in most physics engine. What's the limiting step? Collisions. Collisions, right? So I won't replay the fractal robot, you can go and watch it. We didn't respect self-collision. So different voxels inside the fr fractal robot, if they came into contact with one another, we just, we didn't detect or resolve that collision. We just allowed them to pass through one another. A voxel that comes in contact with the ground that we did detect and resolve because we don't want the fractal robot falling through the ground. Detecting and resolving collisions among voxels or beams, doesn't really matter which one you do, that are deforming in shape is very, very complicated. Towards the beginning of the semester, we talked about detecting collisions just between pairs of spheres, which is already tricky. Calculating collisions between, uh, between cubes that do not deform their volume or shape is even trickier still. Co uh, detecting collisions between cubes that deform their shape and volume uh, and material properties, more difficult still. That's the state of the art at, at the moment. If anybody has any clever ideas there, we are definitely all ears. Okay. Okay, so we are going to switch now uh, to our second last uh, lecture here where we've talked about rigid robots, we've talked about transitioning to the simulation and ver physical verification of soft robots. In that transition, we switched from working with uh, steel and plastic and hard electronics to soft materials, hollow uh, silicone voxels. Our colleagues at Yale are in the process of making flexible electronics. So it's getting possible now on that physical soft robot to add electronics or pattern electronics onto the body of the robot where those electronics have soft wires, soft resistors, soft capacitors, soft batteries, soft actuators. So everything still remains fluid. So in this transition, we're spending a lot more time now as a, as a research field looking at the material properties of the component parts from which the robot is built. Now we're going to switch from soft robots to biological robots, where again, most of the devil in the details is in paying close attention to the new materials we're using for building our robots, which in this case are going to be biological cells. Question? Both the robots we've been looking at, at least at the top of them, have been able to be transferred to the somewhat real world? Most of them have not been transferred to the real world. A few of them have been. <laughs> And I showed you the, the breathing robot there, which is, we're kind of close to crossing the gap there. It's possible, but like I mentioned, we're now caught up to the present day. This is ongoing work now to try and figure out what crosses and what doesn't cross the gap and why. What is it about those soft robots that do cross the gap versus those that don't? And when we talk about biological robots today and on Thursday, I want you to keep that same question in the back of your mind. You're going to see some biobots that do cross the gap and some that don't. We are still in the dark. We understand very little about why some do and some don't. Yeah? Okay.
Permit me to take a few minutes to tell you the origin story of the Xenobots here. Uh, about four years ago now, uh, my research group and an, a group of biologists at Tufts University, we were given a joint uh, a funding project uh, by the government to study what's called lifelong learning. Lifelong learning. Our current machines, including uh, autonomous cars, we train them, train them, train them at Google's campus in Silicon Valley, and then allow those autonomous vehicles to go out on the road. And at the moment, once they leave the Google campus and they uh, start driving around in Mountain View, California, no more training of the autonomous vehicles. There are a lot of people at Google headquarters uh, and Tesla and where else that have their fingers crossed, right? Hopefully all the training that we did before we deploy these intelligent machines is enough to allow them to be useful in the real world while at the same time remaining safe. And that is a gamble that our society is still waging at the moment. Lifelong learning is an, att is a, 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 an attempt to try and change the discourse and think about creating machines that are constantly adapting and learning on the job, right? There are advantages to that. Obviously, every organism on this planet uh, engages in lifelong learning. Learning doesn't stop. But it's also a little bit scary and a little bit dangerous, right? Imagine you are a passenger in an autonomous car that is curious and trying to figure out what happens if it speeds up, slows down, turns left, turns on its blinker. It's a little bit, a little bit uh, strange to think about. So this funding, uh, this funding source was focused on trying to explore all the different ways we could create lifelong living machines. My group and the Tufts group asked the following question, which is, organisms and cells have billions of years of experience performing lifelong learning. So we could observe organisms and try and build that into uh, machines like we do in robotics, or alternatively, just make machines out of living tissue and hope that those biological machines inherit a lot of the useful stuff from nature that we want, which in this particular project was lifelong learning. That was the idea we pitched to the government. How exactly we were gonna do that wasn't very clear at the beginning. So we got lucky, we got funded, then the hard part began, which is how are we actually gonna do this? So we started out four years ago by having weekly Zoom meetings. Uh, one of the first meetings, my PhD student, Sam Kriegman, showed our biology colleagues this video. We were just finishing the soft robotics work that I just showed you. The next week, our biology colleagues showed us this image on the Zoom call. Doug Blackiston, one of the members of the Tufts team, he's a microsurgeon, was inspired by our soft quadruped. So after showing, uh, showing our biology colleagues this video, Doug went into the lab and spent a, a few days looking down the microscope. He took individual frog cells from a frog embryo, early frog embryo, basically a frog egg, took out some of these cells and very carefully put these cells together to create a sculpture of our simulated soft quadrupedal robot. This is not a robot. This is just a floating mass of frog cells that are floating in room temperature pond water inside a Petri dish under a microscope. Questions? Will they actually connect together? Or glued together? They are absolutely glued together. They are almost literally uh, glued together. So uh, most cells, and especially uh, cells taken from early embryo, they're very sticky. They have protein, uh, proteins on the cellular surface called cadherins, meaning adhere together. They're very, very sticky. As I'm gonna show you some videos in a moment. You'll see just how sticky they are. They're actually hard to pull apart. They tend to like to stick together. So it's basically trying to create uh, a sculpture out of uh, balls of cellophane tape, where the ball of cellophane tape is a micron across, right? It's a cell. Doug is an extremely talented microsurgeon, no caffeine, he's got very steady hands, he's like a concert pianist. You'll see Doug at work in a moment, some of the videos, very, very difficult to build, but it's all mechanical. There's no genetic engineering here. This is just taking genetically unmodified cells 
and putting them together to make a sculpture, which is about a millimeter across. You can just see xenobots with the naked eye. If you were to look into the Petri dish unaided with a microscope, you'd see something that looks like a speck of pepper in the dish. That's how, about how big this is. So far, so good? When Doug showed this on our Zoom call, as you can probably imagine, there was stunned silence on the call. First of all, we were trying to figure out what we were looking at. And after Doug, this microsurgeon, explained to us what we saw, as roboticists, what do you think our next question or questions were? How do we make it move? How do we make it move? Yeah? OK. So now that we saw this was possible, how do we take this bio sculpture and turn it into a bio bot, something that moves? OK. Now things started to get tricky. Here's an example of an experiment that Doug Blackiston, the microsurgeon, and Mike Levin, the head of the lab at, at Tufts, reported back in 2013. In this experiment, this, these aren't, this is not robotics, this is not xenobots, this is not biobots. They took a genetically uh, modified tadpole in this case. It's been genetically modified not to grow eyes in the normal place. So there are no eyes at the front of this developing tadpole. They dug surgically implanted a group of eye precursor cells. So these are a, a type of stem cell that's typically in an adult frog will develop into an eye. Placed them in the tail of the tadpole. Not only did this uh, surgical procedure on this very early uh, tadpole not kill the tadpole, the tadpole grew into a perfectly healthy frog that had an eye on its back. Sorry? Is there, a picture? is there a picture? You have to go check out the paper. It's too early in the morning to look at these pictures. Well, I'll show you this one. You can look at the rest when you feel ready to. OK. So not only, not only does this embryo grow into a healthy frog with a quite radical change to its morphology, during development, as it developed from a tadpole into an adult frog, the eye precursor cells developed into a mature eye. They sent out neural connections to, uh, to the spinal cord, uh, to, uh, um, to the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system in the tail of the tadpole. And these two nervous, nervous processes shook hands, connected. Why did they blind, why did they genetically blind the tadpole? Why do you think? They wanted to see whether the eye could see, and the answer is yes. This frog could actually orient and chase prey or run away from shadows using the eye on its back. Yeah? Uh, do they have depth perception? Not, not like us, uh, uh, right? But pretty good, right? They send out their tongue, and they can catch a fly in three-dimensional space. So they, they have some form of depth perception. They're able to, to anticipate depth relatively well. This one, obviously, not so much. Yeah? OK. Lots of things that are surprising about this experiment. We haven't even got to biobots yet. What are some of the surprising aspects of this, aside from the fact that it's possible at all? The robustness of, uh, I guess, a living thing. Uh, the robustness of a living thing. This is the number one thing I want you to keep in your mind during today's lecture and Thursday's lecture. From the point of view of an organism, which we talked about at the beginning of this course, Heraclitus 2,000 years ago said, man never enters the same river twice. Humans and most organisms on this planet, we seem relatively able to deal with external changes. Our machines, our current state-of-the-art machines, are terrible at it. It's not that difficult to overwhelm or surprise an autonomous car or even the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Machines are not very good at dealing with external surprise. Why are organisms so good at dealing with external surprise? Because the cells from which we are composed have three and a half billion years experience dealing with internal surprise. Yeah? This is where thinking about thinking gets particularly misleading. Right? When we look at organisms, we tend to look at the organism as a whole. Right? But remember that an organism is simply a collection of cells, and each individual cell itself is a vastly complicated machine which is very adaptive. 
The environment for a frog is a pond and sun, uh, day, night, rain, and so on. The, the environment for a cell inside the frog is other cells, right? So if we now take the point of view of a cell, we talked about proximal and distal perspectives of robots. I want you to take the proximal perspective of a cell. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a cell. It's got various neighbors, and those neighbors are changing constantly over the lifetime of a robot, uh, of, of a frog. Frog is growing, there's more cells, more neighbors. Those cells are migrating through the body uh, of the frog as it develops. Cells on the outside of the frog and of us die off and are replaced by new ones coming from within to replace them. There is constant change, constant churn inside the body of every organism. And the organism itself has to surf on, uh, on that churn. It has to continuously be able to keep itself fed, oxygenated, uh, free from injury, and so on. So for us, from the distal perspective, this looks frightening, surprising. It doesn't seem like this is possible. From the point of view of the cells inside this tadpole, this is child's play. Okay, there's some eye precursor cells here. I know what that means. Those have to connect to the brain of the, of the embryo somehow, of the tadpole somehow. That's, that's gonna send signals to tell these cells to grow into an eye. When that eye grows, it's gonna, it's gonna deflect light in a certain way. It's gonna be captured by neurons. Neurons know to interpret those signals in a particular way. Presumably the neurons don't really care where on the body those signals from an eye are coming from. Yeah, thinking about thinking is misleading. Once you start to uh, put, put yourself in the shoes of a cell, it's not so surprising from a cell's perspective what's going on here. So far, so good. Other questions? Okay, we all learned in high school biology that frog DNA encodes frogs, human DNA in, in, uh, encodes humans. Seems we were lied to all these years. Whatever the answer is, and the answer is still emerging, it's not as simple as that. Genetics do not specify frog or oak tree or human. They encode something else. Is it kind of like it encodes what to do at each step given the current state? But if you change the current state to something unusual, then they do something else. Exactly. Uh, there are a lot. There have been lots of metaphors over the decades about what DNA is. One of the most popular ones is DNA is the blueprint of the organism. Whatever DNA is, it's not a blueprint, right? It's not a static picture saying, make this, make frog, make oak tree, make human. It's more like a recipe. It says, if, or an algorithm. The DNA says, if this happens, do this. If there are cells over here, do that. If the cells happen to be over there, do this, right? This looks like a pretty radical reconfiguration of the tadpole. But this tadpole has already gone through many, many transformations from its origins, which was a single cell. Yeah? Okay. So given this changing view in biology that DNA is not a blueprint, it's an algorithm, that suggests many things. One of them is if Dub the microsurgeon can rearrange frog tissue like this, what happens if we turn over the task of rearrangement to an evolutionary algorithm? So that was our next question, how to turn this frog sculpture into a frog robot. Four years ago, Doug told us that he can manipulate certain kind of cells from early frog embryo. Um, this is the particular frog he works with, uh, Xenopus lavis. Xenopus lavis, Xenobot. That's where the nickname for the Xenobots came from. Uh, he could extract from uh, Xenopus lavis cells, skin cells, passive soft tissue, sounds familiar. He could also extract uh, myocardiac tissue. So these are cells or patches of cells that develop eventually in an adult frog into tissue that spontaneously increases and decreases in its volume. If you take tissue that spontaneously increases and decreases its volume and wrap it around into a hollow shape, you get a pump, right? When all those cells contract in their volume, 
they contract their inner hollow volume. And if that inner hollow volume is filled with blood, it will push the blood out. And when they relax back, the blood will be, or expand their volume, other blood is pulled back into this pump, otherwise known as a heart. Yeah? So Doug told us that he could work with, and therefore our evolutionary algorithm could work with two different building blocks, passive soft material and active material that will spontaneously increase and decrease in volume. You can probably see where this is going. Okay, so uh, Sam, who took over from Doug here, did more or less what he was already doing with our soft robot colleagues at Yale, which is creating an evolutionary algorithm that uses a population of CPPNs to create the geometry and distribution of these two different voxel types across the geometry of the robot. In the, the soft robotics experiment we just saw, there were four different types of voxels, bone, tissue, and agonist and antagonistic muscle groups. In this case, there are just two types, blue and red-green voxels, where red-green voxels increase and decrease in volume. So that's one minor difference from the soft robotics experiment you just saw. There's another important difference between the experiment you just saw and this one. What is it? You can see it in the video. The red-green voxels are acting very different from the red voxels and the green voxels we just saw in the soft robotics experiment. What's the difference? They're alternating, so if you look, very, it may be hard to see from where you're sitting. Uh, when they're green, that's them expanding. When they're red, that's them contracting. So they're in, these voxels are increasing and decreasing their volume, like we saw in the soft robotics experiment. But if you look at a patch of them, a group of them together, there is an important difference between patches of red voxels and green voxels from the previous experiment. There's not just two phases. You'll notice that there aren't uh, two separate groups that are increasing and decreasing together. Every individual voxel here has its own phase offset. Some of them are increasing while others are decreasing. Some are somewhere in between. They're not synchronizing in any way. This is an important biological detail that we built into the simulation that Doug the microsurgeon told us which is that frog heart tissue, when it, when it develops into the shape of a frog heart, however this happens, somehow those cells know they're in the right shape, they talk to one another, and they synchronize so that they all increase and decrease in volume in synchrony. Super, super important. Uh, for a lot of elderly uh, human adults, atrial fibrillation occurs in which this synchronization in the human heart starts to break down and different parts of the heart uh, cells increase volume while other ones decrease and you start to get fibrillation. You start to get hiccups in a regular heartbeat. Very, very worrying. Doug told us that with frog heart tissue, we asked, we asked Doug what would happen if we rearrange the, if we rearrange group patches of frog heart muscle cell into shapes other than the heart, his answer was, I don't know because no one's ever done it. So we built into the simulator a conservative estimate. We just said, we don't know whether these patches will synchronize in which they'll all increase and decrease together. So we're going to randomize it. Every time we simulate one of these simulated xenobots, we're going to make all of the heart muscle voxels increase and decrease at random phase offsets. We're sprinkling noise into the simulator in a particular way. Where have we heard that before? We're going to try and cross the sim to real gap in a moment. In order to help try and cross the gap, we're making things deliberately hard on the evolutionary algorithm. It's going to have to try and build a simulated xenobot out of randomly moving parts. Where did we hear about this before? or this general idea of sprinkling noise. Way back when we started talking about the sim to real gap, 
we looked at the radical envelope of noise hypothesis. The very first experiment back in the 90s with this little Kepra robot that was driving through this T maze and was supposed to turn right when it saw a light on its right, was supposed to turn left when it saw a light on its left. The, the simulator at that time was, was two lookup tables. It was two Excel spreadsheets, right? Super simple simulator. But by adding noise into that simulator, they managed to cross the gap. They transferred controllers evolved on simulated, uh, simulated Kepras onto real robots. Sometimes the old tricks are still the best tricks. This is just the 20, 2020 version of this approach. Would you, I, it's a hard to remember, I forget what it's actually called, the pacemaker. The pacemaker cells, yep. Do you guys have that like, uh, CPD in there? Good, good question, so absolutely. So frog hearts and human hearts have other special cells called pacemaker cells, which set the pace. We also asked Doug if, we, if he were to try and build any of these and was try and rearrange or put together patches of frog heart cells, would he, would he uh, without knowing it, be incorporating uh, pa uh, pacemaker cells? And his answer was, I don't know, right? So in the face of uncertainty, we just made a conservative estimate. Assume the worst case. Basically, we're gonna force the evolutionary algorithm to assume that if these things are built in reality, for the frog heart tissue will not spontaneously synchronize. So far, so good? Okay, so here we go. Here are three random xenobots produced from three random CPPNs. We have a population of 100 of these CPPNs. We evolve these CPPNs to produce forward locomotion, like we've seen many times before. We want to maximize the motion of these simulated xenobots from left to right. And we got these end results from 100 different evolutionary runs. These are the 100 champions, the fastest moving simulated xenobots from 100 different evolutionary trials. What happened? Do you see any light blue voxels? What's happened? They're all just balls of muscle. They're all just balls of muscle, like we saw in the previous experiment. Not so surprising. We brought these 100 blueprints to Doug, the microsurgeon, and asked him, could he build these? And the answer was, I can't build any of them. For whatever reason, the microsurgical procedure, which I guess I will show you next time, he wasn't able to do it. He had to, he had to use skin as sort of scaffolding. He could not build under the microscope balls of muscle. So we've already failed to cross the reality gap in 100 out of 100 attempts. We didn't even get to reality in this case. So we failed sim to real, but we're now gonna perform real to sim. We asked Doug, why can't you build balls of muscle? What else, what else should we do? He said, well, you need, I need at least about 50% skin cells as sort of the base on which to build the muscle for whatever reason. We took that detail and we put it back into the evolutionary algorithm. Most of these balls of muscle, like you saw in the soft robot experiments, they were also bouncing around. They were pronking like Pepe Le Pew. He said, there's no way a, a xenobot built with frog heart tissue is gonna bounce along the bottom of a Petri dish. You gotta tune down the force of these simulated muscle groups. So we tuned that down. We were doing real to sim. We were taking information about real biology and putting it back into the simulation. And we did these 100 evolutionary runs again where the muscle now is much weaker. And we also built some uh, terms into the fitness function to reward for using passive material. We got back these 100 blueprints. Question? So what's like the time frame? Like, uh, like when you do, when you get the information from Doug and yep. you're doing the 100 trials. Yep, what's the time frame? Good question. So it took about, uh, I think about two weeks for Sam to incorporate some of these details back into the evolutionary algorithm. We have a GPU cluster, uh, Deep Green, which runs over in South Burlington. It took another, I think about two or three weeks to do the 100 evolutionary trials on the supercomputer to produce these 100 blueprints. These, the second set. So about two weeks to produce this. We get back one word from Doug, no, 
Then we ask him why, got some information back, took a few weeks to change the evolutionary algorithm, ran the evolutionary algorithm for another two weeks, and we're out of time for today. I'll tell you what happens next, Thursday morning. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on your A-B testing. Have a good rest of your day.